Hi there and welcome. As you may know, I have a stage 5 chronic kidney disease. And today, I thought I would talk about my chronic kidney disease journey so far. Where do I start? I guess it started in 1998 when I was diagnosed with kidney stones. Um, I was admitted into hospital and I had an operation to remove kidney stones from both my kidneys, my bladder and ureter. I was told by the doctors that the kidney stones had damaged my kidneys and that my kidney function was now 25%. Although I didn't really comprehend what that meant at the time. And I thought having the kidney stones was the end of the matter and that my kidneys were just not as good as a normal person's. When I got home, I was fine. I think I felt fine. I just got tired more easily than a normal person. I didn't really think anything of it. And so I basically got on with my life. Roll on to 2005. I then met my future wife, Simone, who I love very much. She is the centre of my world. I, I don't know what else to say about her. Um, we got together um, and decided to go around the world together. I quit my job, sold the house, we travelled around the world for six months, we came back, settled down, and in 2007 we had our son, Oscar born, who is the centre of my life. In 2010 we got married, things were good. Roll on into 2013, I had a good job. No, we're happy. But I was starting to feel unwell. I was getting headaches. More tired than normal. And Simone kept saying to me, you need to go to the doctors. You need to go to the doctors. I didn't really want to go. I didn't think anything was wrong with me. So... Reluctantly, I was dragged to the doctors and in November 2013 um, I had a blood test and I was told the bad news that my kidneys were not as good as, as expected and so I was referred to a kidney specialist. Um, I had some tests and uh, some scans and it was confirmed that my kidney function had dropped to 15% and I was diagnosed with stage 5 chronic kidney disease. I was told that my kidneys would only get worse and that I would have to have dialysis or transplant to remain alive. I was shocked to say the least. You know, I bet when most people hear the phrase chronic illness it conjures up images of an old granny in a nursing home. The thing is I now realise that chronic illness isn't limited to the elderly. Chronic illness is defined as a long-lasting condition that can be controlled and or not cured and it includes things like arthritis, kidney disease, depression, diabetes and many more. Many of these illnesses are invisible which means you can't tell if someone has them. So if you look at them and they look healthy then they must be healthy. I was a prime example as I looked well on the outside, 
but inside was a different matter. 2014 was a difficult year for me as I had to endure loads of tests, you know, to check why I was, my kidneys were failing and what was wrong. I had scans, blood tests, and I was told that I'd have to go on the transplant list. And so I had to have more scans and blood tests to see if I was fit enough to go on the transplant list. On the whole, most of my family and friends have been very supportive for me, especially Simone and Oscar, my son, who have been my rock. However, the one person that I thought I would could count on, my brother, has turned his back on me. He and his wife thought I was exaggerating my condition and being melodramatic when I told him about my illness. And he said, you'll be okay. What's the fuss about it? your life? Con your condition isn't life threatening as you can get dialysis or a transplant. You haven't got cancer or heart disease or anything serious like that. He will never comprehend what me and the family have to go through. Understand how hurt you made me feel. He just did not understand how hard it is for somebody both physically and emotionally, to live with chronic illness. I tried to explain my situation to the best of my ability, but he didn't know what all the fuss was about and just refused to listen. Instead, he took advantage of my weakened state and left me depressed, frustrated, sad and even guilty that I had this condition. But I didn't want his pity, I just wanted his respect and understanding of my circumstances. So I now removed him from my life, I was like, don't expect that sort of betrayal and negativity from a family member. It's a real shame, as I've not spoken to him since 2014, which has left a, a huge hole in my heart feel empty because of it. But what could I do? Also in 2014, I had to give up my job. I was a scientist working for a pharmaceutical company. But because of the ongoing nature of my illness and the fatigue and memory problems it was causing, I was finding my job increasingly difficult. And so, um, it became very stressful for me, and I was worried about letting people down. And so, unfortunately, I decided the only thing I could do was to leave work and take early retirement. This was a hard decision and was very upsetting for me. This was not only hard for me, but hard for Simone as well, who had to become the sole breadwinner of the family. In December 2014, I was finally placed on the kidney transplant waiting list. 2015 was hard for me and the family as we struggled with the continuing symptoms of my failing kidney, which I've discussed in my previous video about what kidney, chronic kidney disease is, what the symptoms are and treatments. On January 31st, 2016, an amazing thing happened. I had a kidney transplant. I remember it was a Saturday night. We had a Chinese takeaway. Otisco had just gone to bed and we'd been watching TV in the evening. Um, it was about 11 o'clock at night. It was nearly bedtime for us. And my f mobile rang. I looked at it and thought, who could be ringing at that time of night? The number was withheld, so I ignored it and let it ring off. About 10 seconds later, Simone's mobile rang. Immediately, I sort of suspected, it's a kidney. It's a kidney for me. 
Simone answered it, and yes, it was Manchester Royal Infirmary. They had found a kidney from me, and we had to get to Manchester within two hours. Well, I was shocked. I didn't really want to go, as I was shit scared. But Simone said, it'll be okay, you need to go, you need to go. So we put Project Kidney into motion. Well, to be honest, we didn't really have a plan. Um, I just packed up some overnight stuff. We woke up Oscar, rang the in-laws, told, told them what was happening. We drove there, dropped off Oscar, who was in a bit of a daze, so that he could sleep there overnight. And then we made our way to Manchester. It was so unreal as we drove in the dark to Manchester. Everything seemed to be in slow motion. We finally arrived in, at the Manchester Royal Infor Infirmary at about uh, midnight. We arrived in Ward 9 and I was um, admitted into a bed. As I was sat there waiting for the nurse to perform all her checks on me, I was petrified, which showed as my blood pressure and heart rate were sky high. I remember Simone and the nurse saying to me, you need to calm down so we can get your heart rate down. Well, that's easily said and done. I had a chest x-ray done, more blood tests done, and we just waited throughout the night, waiting for me to go down to, to the surgery. Around five o'clock, I said to Simone, you might as well go home and try and get some sleep. Nothing's going to happen yet. So she went home, left me there. Uh, I tried to sleep myself, but I couldn't. I just sat in bed wondering and worrying about the day ahead. I was not even allowed any food or drink because of the upcoming operation. Eventually, after hours of waiting, I was taken down to surgery. I think it was around 9 o'clock in the morning. Um, I remember speaking to the surgeon about something and the anaesthetist about something else. And then the surgeon or someone told me to count down from 10. I remember starting to count, but I can't remember what number I got to because everything went blank. The next thing I remember is being woken up by one of the surgeons who told me that the operation had been done. I was in a lot of pain and very groggy from the operation. I was taken back to Ward 9. And they asked the nurses to contact Simone so that they could let her know that I was okay. I don't really remember much else because, except being in a lot of pain. I was um, in hospital for about three weeks. I don't remember much in the hospital. It's all a bit of a daze, really. But unfortunately, the transplant did not work as they expected. The new kidney did not wake up. And I was told by various doctors it might take up to three months to wake up. I hated being in a hospital. It was so depressing. Plus it was very hard on my family who had to travel an hour each, each day, each way to see me. We live in Crewe and the hospital was in Manchester. They tried to see me every day at first, but it was too much for them. So in the end they, decided, they cut it down to two or three times a week. I was so looking forward to going home and getting away from hospital food. Even, even though I was stabilised from the operation, the, the new kidney still had not woken up. But the doctors agreed that I could be let out. I was so happy that I was told I would finally go home. But after leaving the hospital, I still had to go back the hospital two or three times a week for regular blood tests and checkups. I was in pretty ill and then when I got home and on top of 
the new kidney not working profitably, I was in a lot of pain from the operation. And I am well because of all the side effects of all the drugs I was taking. The doctors kept saying to me, the new kidney will wake up eventually. They even tried me on steroids and different variations of anti-rejection drug. But it did not work. I had loads of blood tests and scans to find out what was wrong. Uh, but there was no indication of infection or rejection. Instead so they showed that the kidney was working fine. Then they did a biopsy, a biopsy of the kidney, and that found what was wrong. The biopsy showed that no kidney had had vascular disease. So the, trans the reason the transplant hadn't worked was because the donor kidney was diseased. This was very upsetting and frustrating for me. I could not believe that I had received a diseased kidney. And unfortunately, around 3% of kidneys from dead donors just do not work for one reason or another. I guess it's just the luck of the draw, me receiving a kidney, which was diseased. Which is why there's a much better chance of a kidney working from a live donor. Because the donor has to have loads of checks themselves, and any potential with a donor kidney will be picked up. So although um, I recovered from the operation, I had to contend with the continuous side effects of the concoction of drugs I was taking. Mood swings, depression, extreme nausea and tremors being the worst of them. Which I wouldn't have minded if the actual transplant had worked. And on top of that, I had anemia, magnesium deficiency, potassium deficiency and... I'm on the verge of being diabetic. Fortunately, I was pre-dialysis before the transplant, as my kidney function ranged from 12 to 15 percent. And now it's the same. The transplant had no effect whatsoever. The doctors have more or less resigned to the fact that the transplant hasn't worked. And now gradually reducing anti-rejection medication with a view to putting him back on the transplant list. They'll probably leave the kidney in unless it becomes medically necessary to remove it. Some people have two or three transplants before they find that one works. I have now been transferred from the Manchester Royal Infirmary to North Staffordshire Hospital to be cared under them. Um, I have a check up every month now. And they are in the process of reactivating me on the transplant list. I must admit the care and organisation at North Staffordshire is a lot better than it was in Manchester. The nurses and doctors have been brilliant. I have to say I was very disappointed with the aftercare at Manchester Royal Infirmary. So, as you can imagine, it's been a terrible nine months with endless trips to the to one hospital or another, and then the stress and anguish of finding out that I'd received as a diseased kidney. I've tried to remain positive, but it's been very hard for me. And my lovely wife, Simone, and son, Oscar, have been brilliant in their support of me. And I'm sure it's been hard for them too, watching me going through this. There is a small part of me that is been keeping my fingers crossed that one day the new kidney will heal itself and wake up eventually. But I have accepted the fact it will never work and that I might have to go on dialysis at some point. I have felt so down and depressed because the transplant didn't work and because of the side effects the anti-rejection medication was causing. And even though I'm going back on the transplant list soon, I am in two minds whether I want another transplant from a dead donor. I don't think I want another year like that again. 
I've just had enough of being prodded and poked by doctors. I'm sure you can understand. I don't know what the future will bring, whether I'll be out again on dialysis or not, whether I will have a transplant or not. But I'm trying to remain as positive as I can and live as life as best to the bit of my ability, but it's hard. But on a final important note, I just want to say that even though the transplant hasn't worked, I'm very thankful for the donor and their family, as without donors and, and their decision to use organs after their death, life-saving transplants can never take place. More than 10,000 people need an organ transplant in the UK alone, so donation is extremely important. And even though I've had problems, most people can have transplants which are very successful and have no problems at all, and these have improved their lives tremendously. So I urge you to join the, the Organ Donation Register. The website is shown below. Anyway, thanks for watching, and please don't forget to click that like or subscribe button. See ya!